is up, everyone? Welcome to the first Ginger Runner Live of 2022, episode number 383. Palindrome. Yeah. Your favorite. Big palindrome fan here. <laughs> uh, as far as palindromes go, 383. It's a pretty good one. It's okay. Pretty good one. Uh, on tonight's episode, because we're starting the year off, we wanted to start it off right. So we're bringing in our dear friend, David Roach, Coach David Roach, uh, for another one of our Ask Coach Roach podcasts. Uh, this one in particular, I think is episode 13 of our Ask Coach Roach series. Lucky number 13. Lucky number 13. Uh, not a palindrome. What a fun fact to learn on Ginger Runner Live. <laughs> we're just uh, we're hitting dingers right from the start. Um Tonight's going to be great. If you have any questions in regards to your running, your training, anything like that, these are the episodes where you get to ask David uh, those hard-hitting questions. But tonight, we're also going to be talking about training secrets going into 2022. David, obviously a prolific writer with Trail Runner Magazine and all sorts of uh, websites and, and blogs and stuff like that. David has so much knowledge we're going to dig in today because he's got some secrets for us all. On Ginger Runner Live. Sit back, relax, everyone. The show begins now. Ginger Runner. Yay! Yay! What is up, everyone? <laughs> Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 383, our first Ginger Runner Live of 2022. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy Tuesdays to spend a little bit of it with us. I feel like I need to like shake the cobwebs out. Oh, we're rusty. Just like in the intro, I was like, oh, I have all these questions for David in my mind. But I'm like, is that relevant for the show? Like, I want to talk about cheer. I want to talk about Wordle because I <laughs> I know that David has mentioned staying away from Wordle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there's all these like Man, I, are these secrets content. to training. Yeah, we're going to this is going to be a great episode. So <laughs> we're going to use this first episode of 2022 uh -huh. as our rust buster. Uh, I think we are all going to have some rust busting to do this year with training and leading up to races and, and getting back into the groove of things and stuff like that. But we're very excited about tonight's show, as Kim mentioned. We have a wonderful guest. He's our, one of our favorite humans on earth. That's uh, true. That is true. He's our coach. He's many people's coach. Coach David Roach is joining us. Uh, this is our ongoing episodic series known as Ask Coach Roach, where you get to ask your hard-hitting training questions, anything that you might have in regards to uh, your training, your preparation for races. You get to ask those questions of one of the uh, most amazing coaches in the business who coaches uh, elite athletes of all levels, from Olympic athletes to uh, elite athletes um, and mid-packers and back-of-the-packers, yep. all the same. We're very excited and honored to have him on. Before we introduce him, of course, it's not just myself. It's not just uh, uh, Kim. <laughs> we also have the live audience. And Kim, you're keeping your eye on the live audience today, right? That's true. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Ginger Runner Live. If you're new, say hi in the chat room. Uh, there is already some cheer chatter in the chat, which is making me very delighted. It was inevitable. <laughs> just mentioning it. Uh, one, will help our views go up. It's a hit show. Uh, and two, I think the discussion is going to get... Or we'll get flagged. Uh, yeah, yeah, or we'll get flagged. Totally. <laughs> uh, also, in addition to our live audience, and Kim and myself, we do have some individuals that we like to thank at the top of the show before we introduce our guest, and that is our GR crew. If you watch my recent video, my goals video for 2022, I mentioned them quite regularly. Uh, the GR crew is the whole reason that we're able to do this, this live show every single week, our daily live show known as Daily Brew, our reviews, our films, everything, and it's because of them uh, and all of the support from them on Patreon. If you'd like to join the GR crew, it's very easy to do. Head on over to patreon.com slash the ginger runner. All tiers get access to some really fun perks, including tonight's after show with David. Uh, that is for all tiers. And uh, we would love for you to join the GR crew. It really is a fun community and truly inspiring uh, we have some incredible members of the community doing some big things this year and and the support and rallying behind them is astounding so uh join the crew it's worth it two individuals in particular at the top of uh the patreon um tier list there of course brian sands and rick bjarnison brian sands been longtime supporter truly inspiring individual himself and has inspired many people to take on their first ultra and ultra distance and beyond uh, we love Brian. Brian's a longtime friend of the show. And Rick Bjarnison, ultra runner out of British Columbia, Canada. Rick and his company, CheekyMonkeyMedia.ca. They redid the GingerRunner.com website uh, a couple of years ago, and they maintain it to this day. Rick, uh, just a wonderful individual. So big shout out to both Rick and Brian and thank them for helping us do what we do. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our incredible guest who's been in, insanely patient 
waiting to talk about Wordle and cheer because that's that's tonight's <laughs> entire content. <clears throat> Just kidding. David Roach. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I can't wait. And uh, similarly, another important topic, like because this is the first episode of 2022, I was like, I need to bring my A game. So one, collared shirt, big step up. Nailed two, it. I cut my own hair today because that's been something I, I've always done. And I realized I forgot to look in the mirror after I cut my hair. So you could be getting anything right now. In fact, what I do is like <laughs> right when I get to the lowest setting, that I use like right down here, I also just swipe across my eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> Things You might be getting a whole lot that I'm not really looking at right now. Um, so I think it's the one problem when you get really comfortable with your partner is, uh, you know, I know Megan loves me, so... I don't love mirrors and it's a, it's a tenuous relationship when we're on a video uh, medium like this. So thank you for having me. I apologize for any empty spaces. Uh, well, you are missing your right eyebrow. Yeah. You have no right eyebrow, but I've yeah. added it in post. So no. there's a filter you're, you're covered. It's got a little, little eyebrow over you. You're good. Yes. Ariana Grande is doing that now. And I'm just trying to keep up with her. I'm actually impressed that you do your own that you cut your own hair. We, since the pandemic, Kim has actually taken on the chore of doing my I've been hair. cutting Ethan's hair now since March, 2020. And it's really good. Like, honest, I'm, it's okay -ish. I'm wearing a hat, not because it's terrible, but because I like hats, but uh, Kim nails it. So you do it yourself. That's impressive. I've done it myself since I was like 10 years old. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm one of those people that I'm like, I can cut hair. Sure. So I um, probably walked around most of my childhood with like big empty splotches in the back of my head. Uh -huh. um, I think the bigger question is here, what type of parents are letting their kid cut their own hair? <laughs> at 10 years old? And I think if you answer that question, you kind of get the whole David Roach origin story. You can kind of understand <laughs> everything right there. Being affirmed uh, as I, you know, chop up my hair like it's uh, some rowdy weeds or something. The good news is that we actually have your parents on our <laughs> call. We're going to bring them in and find out what the hell they were thinking. Well, um, oh, we just lost them. I don't. We just lost them. I'm sorry. Dude, <laughs> they out. could never figure out the uh, the video setting. My, they're they just moved to Colorado where we are, um, and but they're like 30 minutes away, and they're like, "Can you come up this weekend? We can't figure out how to like do Netflix or whatever." So. <laughs> Uh, this would never happen. For them. In fact, it barely happens for me. So, uh, you know, just just my presence here at all is a minor miracle with my uh, <laughs> extremely non tech savvy, but extremely, uh, you know, affirming me parents uh, since I was a little kid. Well, we certainly are thankful anytime we get you on the show because we know how much time it takes you to get your computer on. Um, <laughs> so the fact that you're here, still here. <clears throat> We're going to take advantage, uh, uh, take advantage of as much of this time as I possible. Did, I did share with you before we before we started recording yeah. that my keyboard is eroded down. So if anyone has Mac keys, I mean, I'm not sure if this is a common thing, but, um, you know, I, I think I'm known a little bit for exclamation points. And if you want proof of what that does to a computer and that this isn't just like uh, a passing thing, this is a way of like, I'm going to move the camera. So I apologize for any jarring <laughs> for everyone as I do this, but... There's the shift key. Can you see it? Oh, yeah. We see the light <laughs> coming the right on through. And uh, you might have also in that process seen a number of uh, various food crumbs from the last two to four weeks. So uh, you get we're just thankful you have pants on this time. Yeah, we got confirmation you're wearing pants as well. <laughs> yeah, <okay>. This time. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That would be the best reveal to start 2020. <laughs> YouTube full on just removes this channel from YouTube. They, uh, no, we saw what you did. We saw what you did. That would have been a great surprise. For for who? Anyone. <laughs> for David and yeah. I, I mean, my mom's the, probably watching right now. It's a big David Roach fan. <laughs> um, again, so it's it's awesome to have you on the show. I do want to sort of kick this off with finding out how your holidays were and and what you're looking forward to this year give us a bit of a synopsis since we last had you on a few months ago how has your life been uh what are you looking forward to the most how's 22 and 22 looking for you i'm most looking forward to tiger claw i think <laughs> uh, the best day of the year um but no you know i'm just excited for 2022 i, I was thinking about it um uh, recently that like I think optimism is the most punk rock thing you can do nowadays, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and especially like right now, as I think it's easy to look at kind of all the data points we're getting and being like, oh, so the world's going to end in, 
one to seven years or so, um, <laughs> just in terms of uh, how things can feel on a day to day basis. So, you know, I think going into 2022, like just trying to see all the the beautiful things that are out there. And, you know, I really think that there's going to be a lot of fun to come this year. So for us, I mean, we've had ups and downs. I mean, I don't know if I talked about it on here last time, but uh, Megan was is dealing with like a totally unforeseen and random heart issue. And so that's been super tough, but she's been so strong through it. And maybe that's my biggest piece of optimism heading into 2022 is that if she can do that, if she can get through that, damn, I can do anything. You know, I think any of us can do anything. And so, you know, I have that model <laughs> right there to, to teach me, like, you know, just how to be such a badass boss bitch, which she does every single day. Yeah, she's, she's, I mean, we haven't had her on the show since the diagnosis, but you've talked, I think you talked a little bit about it last time you were on, uh, but we've obviously talked about it a little bit uh, between having you on the show. And it's one of those where, it's one of those things where whatever she's going through, we are empowered by her journey because of, how, you know, she's so amazing and she's able to do what she's doing despite the diagnosis, the optimism, the positive outlook, like just, just what you have all been uh, able to do since that diagnosis has really inspired yeah. a lot of people to sort of pick themselves up for, by the bootstraps and like realize we have our health, we have our family, we have these things that are so necessary for happiness that we've just sort of taken for granted for so long. And I mean, I love that you say kind of approaching this year with with optimism. I feel like last year, I kind of mentioned this in my goals video, but mm. like 2021, I sort of have forgotten already because I felt like I didn't approach the year with, I was just hanging on. Like, let's be honest. I think a lot of people were just sort of hanging on by, by their nails, right? And looking at 2022 is, I don't want another year like that. I want to be able to grab it and I want to be able to live in it and it, maybe it's something that's happened since I've gotten older because I never thought this way in my 20s. Like when you're in your 20s or younger, or even in your early 30s, I wasn't sitting here going like, live every day to the fullest and like it's your last <laughs> and that sort of thing. Like you might say it, but it really was, did I believe it? And now that I'm in my 40s, it's like, I believe it. And I'm finally beginning to sort of realize that we need to do that. Meg is a perfect example of someone who inspires me to to do that. Um and she it, it she can't get her heart rate above 120. Is that sort of the like specific? For, for now, we're for now. kind of you see the problem is she's in that liminal space between like a certain diagnosis that has this type of recovery process and uncertain cause of the diagnosis and just uncertainty going through it. And you know, I, I think that uncertainty more generally to like broaden out that scope um, is something everyone is dealing with on a lot of uh, in a lot of ways. Like when I say optimism, that's with the understanding that. For many people that are here right now, possibly including me, possibly including you guys, it might be a terrible year. Like you could have the worst things happen mm -hmm. to you. Um, but that doesn't like forestall the idea that all of these beautiful things can happen too. In fact, um, a, an amazing Buddhist teacher um, who we we had just discovered, which we were way behind the times, um, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, mm -hmm. just died the other week at 95. So amazing, well, you know, fully lived life. But um, if you've never read his book, Pieces Every Step, it essentially just comes back to this idea of like smile meditation and always trying to come back to a little bit of a smile, even when you know that things aren't like everything that you hope they could be. Um, and it's been so powerful for me because like I, it gave a physical manifestation to these emotional understandings of mindfulness of like coming back to center it has been so helpful. So, um, yeah, I think uh you know, I, I never quite understood like why the Buddha is chuckling or whatever, or in every spiritual system has that. But I think that this is the year of that like kind of quiet knowing chuckle. Uh, I mean, we're coming out on two years after this pandemic kind of kicked off. Yeah. Um, this new normal is not something for us to try to just get through anymore. I think it's something for us to try to like, you know, we're going to fucking thrive now. Yeah. And especially in athletics, like I think athletics is this great chance where you know, there's a lot in life we can't control, but we can't control a lot about how our butt gets out the door and how we think about ourselves in that process. And I think that that's why, you know, athletics is the place to jumpstart this whole year in that way of like an uplifting positive energy for what you're capable of. I love it. Um, I think that's a great sort of segue into talking about approaching this year uh, and how we can 
keep our training moving forward, how we can set goals for ourselves. You you talked to me a little bit about training secrets, and <laughs> I kind of want to dig into that. I, th- I think that's just, just a great way to sort of approach the year with, like anytime you say something like training secrets, it kind of gets me excited. Like, well, what is, <laughs> does David have the secrets or are the secrets things that we have within us the whole time? <laughs> Um, but I, it, it, of course, sort of whets the appetite as to what can we do to help ourselves, amplify ourselves and our abilities. Uh, let's so do this. Basically, what I, the reason I said that is I essentially just wanted like a sexy clickbait thing. that was, <laughs> <laughs> um, But I also was thinking as like an, a thought exercise for myself. It's like, OK, if I had to distill all of training theory into like five points for someone that is just confused by it all and doesn't care really just – and doesn't want to, doesn't have a coach, doesn't want to worry about it. Um, could I do that in a way that would help trainers? And I think I did. Um, so <laughs> I'm actually going to go through them. I'm just going to list them. Yeah. And um, then we can use that maybe as a jumping off point for some questions and then like just go in from there. Um, so it's going to be super simple. You've heard me talk about a lot of these principles before. One, run five days a week. Doesn't matter if it's just 10 minutes. That's the bare bones, like what is needed. For your aerobic system to develop long term. Two, do one hill workout a week. Like you don't need to make it complicated. I'm talking about 10 to 15 minutes of running up, running up a hill as like intervals and then running down. So anything from five by two minute hills to you know six by 90 second hills with run run down recovery. Three, do eight hill strides a week, which are those 20 second to 30 second faster hills. You can spread those out over the course of the week. You can do two, four, two different times. You can do all eight at once. Um, but that'll really improve your max power so that you can get the most out of those other runs you're doing. Uh, four, four, four. Uh, do a controlled tempo run of 20 to 30 minutes every two weeks at, on one of those runs. And so by tempo runs, we don't mean going hard. We mean just going out with that controlled effort around lactate threshold, something you could sustain for about an hour. So it feels uplifting and empowering and then five decide that you can rock the downhills um i think a lot this is gets back to like what's within us already i think everyone listening to this can be an amazing downhill runner and that'll unlock like wonderful performance potential in all types of trail races and trail runs in general but people hold themselves back by saying i am not an athlete i am not capable of this um because the heart rate is low when going downhill for most people or at least a lot lower And so if you work on that, on every single run that you're out there and you hit a downhill and just embrace, okay, I am great at this, then it kind of unlocks everything else. And essentially you put those five tips together, like that's distilling a ton of training theory into just a little bit. Even if you don't have a coach, even if you don't care about where you finish in a race, even if you're just trying to make running feel better, um, you're going to have absolute breakthroughs, I think, um, at basically any distance you want. As you said them, I would find myself like nodding my head one because you incorporate that into our training, but also I love that you were able to distill it down to the fundamentals that can really be applied to anybody at any level. Do you find yourself applying those five tips to, you know, your elite level athlete who's there to compete or do you take them and sort of like, how does it look different for them or is it the same? I mean, it's the same exact principles. I think physiology all adapts in a similar like trajectory Mm. the exact how the dials get turned depends so heavily on genetics and background in particular that how it looks can vary a ton when i said run at least five days a week um for some athletes on the team that means that they're running 11 different times a week uh in the context of a rest day you know five doubles and a long run which is you know people that might put food on the table with it and have freakish genetics and be able to adapt but they're still meeting that that bare, bare minimum. Um, and then similar, but everything else pretty much applies across the board. They're all going to see tempo almost all year round. They're all going to see max output almost all year round spread out over the context of this. And I think that's one of the big things with understanding or thinking about training is that there's no barrier to entry. Like as, as the body adapts, I think a lot of the times we look at whoever that person is, whoever that light on the hill is like the Olympian or the training superstar, whoever, and they're like, Oh, well, if I'm not as like, serious as them, then I can't invest myself in the same way. And the point is, no, you're investing yourself in the exact same way, just in the different context for your genetics and background. Um, so as you're doing that, don't constrain yourself with these, you know, unnecessary self-depreciation 
mechanisms we all have in anything that we're yeah. investing ourselves in. That is total, we don't have time for that in 2022. That is total bullshit. We don't have enough time to say that we're not capable of something or to insult ourselves in front of friends or say, oh, well, I'm not, I'm just like, I'm a back of the packer or I'm a hobby jogger or whatever other term you want to use. It's like, no, you're a badass boss and you need pursuing that is kind of the whole point of life. And I think, you know, someone like Thich Nhat Han, you know, this, this mindfulness expert, what the, when they're saying they're coming, coming back to every moment, essentially they're saying like, yeah, it's okay to care very deeply, but you also know that, you know, in that long-term trajectory that you don't control in the moment, you're fucking awesome no matter what. And as a result, you don't need to ever cut yourself down or say you're not capable or something. I love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah. We do have a, a couple of live questions, of course, as we start to dig into these five uh, training secrets. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and just a reminder, if you guys have questions for David, just pop them into the chat room there as well. A uh, question from Vivian. Vivian says, should the tips be adjusted if you're training for a very flat race? No, I mean, yeah, that's actually a great point. If you have no hills where you are, how, how do you do hills? Um, yeah, I think uh, basically all of that the is getting at is increasing your output. The reason I say do it on hills is because injury risk is far lower on hills because um, the impact forces are significantly less. In some studies, as as much as forty percent less when you're running fast up a hill versus running fast on flats. So as long as you're increasing the output above like your lactate threshold, essentially, which is your one hour effort consistently, and then doing some harder things at the very very top end, you're going to be great. Um, so you know, I love hills just because, you know, injury is the one thing that I am always just like moderately panicked about every time I open an athlete's log, because you never know when that day is going to be that it's like, hey, my Achilles hurts. And I don't think I can run for four months or whatever the doctor says, you know. Um, but no matter what you do, as long as you're practicing, like really listening to your body, um, you can incorporate it all. So um, while I do prefer hills a lot of the time for things like speed work and max output work, um, you can totally make it work on flats. And that's super important too, especially as you're getting closer to flat races. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we both did a big... <laughs> um, speaking of hills, a question that came up for me in my mm. training log recently, and your answer did surprise me. I'm just wondering if we can talk a little bit about it because we have somebody saying just stairs and treadmill will work. Uh, I recently asked you like, hey, if I have um, some hill repeats in my workout and I'm going to be doing it on the treadmill, what percentage is appropriate? So can you talk about uh, what kind of uh, grade that we're talking on treadmill? So what did I say to you? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'll answer. I'll answer. And then we'll, we'll see. We'll see if I'm uh, coherent across a uh, different uh, medium. I would have to pull up my running log to uh, quote you exactly. But I believe you told me something along the lines of like eight to 10 percent. Yeah. So um, the, that's where treadmill, I think, differs a little bit from outside. Um, I was actually planning on writing an article about this eventually that I think eight percent is kind of the magic grade on the treadmill. Um, not just for like, um, hill repeats, but also a lot of speed workouts. I think one of the big problems that athletes face on the treadmill is that the perceived exertion is so high, especially when trying to go fast. It feels like you are going so fast. I mean, I have this problem so much. Like, I cannot do flat intervals on the treadmill or even flatter, like what would be normal outside without feeling like I'm going to fly off the back. It feels so fast. Um, and as a result, my overall output is much weaker too. Um, but at 8%, meanwhile, I feel like the treadmill supercharges fitness. And we've seen that a lot in athletes. So um, I often say to athletes, like, if you're not training for a road marathon or something that requires like very specific speed development, um, in doing your treadmill intervals when you have to, when you're forced inside at 8%, is a great way to, you know, one, really focus on that muscular output of, that the treadmill can really optimize. Um, but two, not have to deal with the like flaily inflatable arm <laughs> part of being on a treadmill that makes it like the worst thing in the world. Um, and so, yeah, we've had a lot of that, especially with our pro athletes, honestly, that are able to go so, so fast. We found that like, if they do their stuff at like 8%, it's much more sustainable for them without, you know, breaking their machine or breaking their souls. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, every time I do hill repeats or any of my workouts on hills, I enjoy it. Like I'm one of the few people that I think, I think it's like one of our favorite, one of our favorite days or yeah. activities is to pick a hill and try to destroy it. Right. Like do as, do as hard effort as you can on these things. 
I'm always, always questioning my hill choice, whether or not it's too steep, uh, not steep enough, not long enough. Uh, is there an ideal setup or should I be adjusting effort or output based off of the steepness of a hill or a mountain or switchbacks versus uh, like a flat surface or a consistent hill? Yeah. So this is actually where I think inside varies a little bit from outside. So if I said to Kim, eight to 10% inside, um, I mean, the, the treadmill belt dynamics change how that feels a little bit relative to outside. Sure. That would be a much steeper feeling grade often for most people. Um, so when we have athletes do hills outside, I usually say, or on the side of a little less, like 6%, which is a more gradual incline. But what I like the most is variance. Like if we're just thinking about bricks in a wall and no one workout matters that much, it's all just a little brick and you're stacking up these bricks, just mix it the heck up over the course of weeks. You know, don't do the same thing every time. Do hills that vary. It might have a little downhill in it. Um, mm -hmm. It might have twists and turns sometimes. It might just be straight up a road other times. Um, mixing up those stimuli is just good for covering your adaptation bases. And that gets back to like a bigger idea about training more generally. It's, you know, I think coaching and training theory sometimes can get so down in the weeds of trying to exert control over processes in a way that is, you know, feels like science, but it's actually just superstition. Mm -hmm. um, because the way adaptation works is so immensely complicated and has so many input variables that we never really know how to trace, you know, uh, intervention A to outcome B. Uh, it's kind of just a random number generator. And then over time, we develop patterns and we associate them. But even then, we're not sure for each individual athlete. And in that context, one of the things that I think, especially for the athletes out there that are self-coaching and worry about this a lot, or coaching other people and worry about it a lot, is just try to cover the range of, you know, intensities and, you know, adaptation stresses in the context of every week or two. If you can do that, the athlete will adapt to their potential as long as you're giving them, you know, your, like, background support and understanding that like aerobic development is key. And that was like the most liberating understanding for me pretty early on in coaching is tracking all this data and getting all this information flow thrown right at my face and seeing that like, oh, you know, some of the dogmatic approaches I assumed were how it should work from all the reading and research is actually not so much how physiology might work in like a practical sense, particularly right. in running in ultras. Yeah, like practical application is is different than book uh, book <clears throat> designed adaptation. I am curious in regards to uh, doubling up because um, we've been doing a lot more trail running as of late and specific mountains and stuff like that. The Tiger Claw course, for example, where every run is going to incorporate climbing uh, yeah. one to 2000 feet guaranteed on every run that we do on these trails. So when we have a specific day a week that is dedicated to hill repeats or hill training, we obviously sort of cater that run to be specific to that. But on the days where we might be running the same routes uh, that incorporate some of those same climbs, should we be approaching them differently? Should we be, you know, power hiking them rather than that higher output? Should we be sort of dialing ourselves back on the days that aren't designated high output days? Yeah, I mean, I think it's so important to keep easy, easy for the most part. But this is one place that I think people get too bogged down in some dogmatic thinking. So, um, you know, people might have heard of MAF training or maximum aerobic function, maximum, whatever you want to call it, which is you keep your easy runs 180 minus heart rate. And for a lot of athletes, I know for me, that means that I end up basically being able to run up hills in, a, in an efficient way whatsoever without my heart rate going above that. Um, and the idea is that the body does not work in these neat silos. Like, when we're thinking about aerobic development, there is nothing about keeping easy, so easy all the time that matters that much. Um, you know, it's a general principle that the body is adhering to as it relates to things like, you know, developing capillaries around working muscles, uh, lipid metabolism and things like that. But the body is so good at adapting to a range of stresses at the same time. So what I say to trail runners in particular is when you're running up hills, for the most part, like on your easy days, don't worry about it. Just get up the hill in an efficient way, in a fun way. As long as you're not spiking that heart rate all the way to lactate threshold all the time, you're fine. Um, and, you know, even if you look at some specific training of athletes, so going to an athlete I believe is just self-coached, which is Jim Walmsley, you know, one of the best athletes ever. A lot of his training in his major build cycles for these trail races essentially involves going to trails and just kind of running. And he kind of goes harder on the uphills. 
And it's like not a whole a whole large amount of like, okay, I'm going to do intervals now. And now I'm going to do this structure. Um, he's using the terrain to help him develop his own workouts because he's so efficient and so magnificent that he can do that. Um, and so for all of us, though, there's a lesson there, which is, hey, have fun. Get up that hill. Don't just default to hiking right away every single time. Run a few more steps every <laughs> run. And if you can do that, um, you know, your overall aerobic system will get stronger with it as long as you're not burning yourself to a crisp by overtraining. That's awesome. I, that's actually really awesome to hear because I really enjoy climbs. And so often it, it, it it's like, oh, I just did a hard training route on this exact climb and I ran the whole thing. And here I am on an easy day, like not able to run the whole thing. Mm. You start getting that mental talk of oh, you, you're not as good as you were two weeks ago, or you, you know, your body is, is suffering. But the reality is like, maybe it's okay to take that down a notch and just Oh yeah. Enjoy the climb up, right? Mix it up as much as possible. Like, I mean, if you, if anyone here follows me on Strava, like they know that the, sometimes my easy runs compared to my fast runs, it's like four minutes per mile difference or five minutes per mile difference. Like there's these huge variations. And the idea is that like all, basically what I'm saying by the, everything is more complicated than you would think is that we can't actually measure any of these variables we're talking about. We're just approximating them through what we think of physiology. But you know what can actually measure it? Our brains. Our brains are incorporating all of these thousands of variables into it answering the question, hey, how do you feel? Um, and once, like, if you can develop that muscle, that understanding of how you feel, that is a way more precise instrument to actually measure something like you know, lactate production than, uh, you know, exact than a pace range relative to your assumed PR or something specific like that. So, um, yeah, if your brain's telling you this is time to chill, then it is time to freaking chill. And there's nothing. <laughs> well. Um, and if your brain's telling you it's time to go, Hey, it's also okay to listen to that too. And it's one of the main things we try to do in coaching is open up that flexibility so that athletes can have fun and also like they're getting the best physiology out of themselves by tuning into the person, you know, the physiologist that knows them best, which is yeah. themselves on like a subconscious level. And hopefully we can kind of help them calibrate it over time. I would love for my internal calibration to be, you know, of course I'm my own worst enemy, but also my best tool. Um, sometimes I do want it to be David Roach. <laughs> because you are uh, specifically with the Tiger Clock course, I'm, I'm thinking of the day that you came and ran and won and ran up Cable Line, which is an extremely, extremely mm, steep I just went up there. Technical trail. You just and did it the other day. I believe that we had a conversation, myself and my friends going up there being like, well, David ran this <laughs> in 17 minutes. Why so I want that voice. There? Why did you go up there when you didn't have to go up there? <laughs> I actually <laughs> really like it. Yeah, it is fun. Uh, honestly, I was looking for mushrooms. Okay. <laughs> uh, I didn't find any. No <laughs> mushrooms on the road. Mushrooms like that. That's that's the main physiological goal. That's tip six. <laughs> uh, it's to watch cheer. Listen, and find I've, I've done some terrible climbs just to see if I, there was mushrooms there. There's no luck. <laughs> yeah, and you've done them multiple times yeah. too in the same run because you're. Oh, maybe I missed some. But I do want that David voice to help me get up that climb in 17 minutes. I think that's that's all I need. So David, if you could just do a recording of you telling me what I need to hear to get up in 17 minutes, uh, <laughs> well, that look, would be great. The self-talk element is so important. Right. Like I think often people aren't aware of the chatter that's going on in their brains at all times. Like um, you know, I think about it with myself in in athletics and like man, I have had to consciously get a hold of that particularly on, I mean, let's say a hill interval or something or running up cable line or whatever. Um, you know, we have evolutionary mechanisms in our brain that are essentially telling us, Hey, don't do that. Um, because that's kind of a central governor on the types of efforts we can do without like dropping dead. Um, mm -hmm. this thing was developed over the course of, you know, hundreds of thousands of years in homo sapiens. And now we're kind of pushing it against it in ways that we're not evolutionarily advantageous you know there was no reason to do a lot of the stuff we're doing um and so you know that like pop anthropology argument is essentially what you're fighting against when you're out there all the time is like hundreds of thousands of years of evolution um so some part of your brain is saying like hey you're gonna die like soon 
what are you doing? Um, and you have to consciously push back against that. And um, I think that that you're going to die thought also gets into the, um, you know, it gets co-opted by the more conscious parts of our brain that are like, you're not enough. Uh, you know, you're not fast enough. You've been better before. All these other things that seep into, um, you know, our background nature. And in that context, there has to be an awareness and redirection all the time. So it doesn't mean you're immediately going to get to like, hey, I am a freaking boss bitch. But like, it kind of has to get there for you to get anywhere close to your potential. Um, which brings us to cheer. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to talk about this real quick. And the reference, that, that was a perfect segue. Um, because there's a scene in uh, cheer season two. You don't need to care about cheerleading. Essentially, they're just really great athletes that do really hard things. Um, it's a great show, but, um, you know, all of it comes down to this immense amount of pressure because their entire season is two minutes, right? And um, during training, one of the cheerleaders, Gabby, for those that uh, mm -hmm. are followers of the show, um, she's having a bad day at practice and she's really down on herself. She leaves. She starts to cry. Um, and another cheerleader named Maddie, uh, <laughs> as she would be, uh, goes into the bathroom with her and starts talking to her. And that's exactly what she says. It's like, Hey, Gabby, you're a bad bitch. Even when you don't feel like it, you know you are. And, um, you know, that by doing that, just by doing that, Gabby was able to go back out there, rock it, and then rock the rest of the season. And the reason Maddie was able to give her that advice is because earlier she had gone through her own crisis very similar, where she wasn't able to do something that was pretty routine. And she was down on herself, much in the way we might be down on ourselves when climbing hills. Um, so all of that is to say is that how can we harness the bad bitch mentality, um, not just because it's more fun, but also because it's the only way for your brain to let your physiology show you what it's capable of and then adapt to that over time. Um, you know, I think that probably 20 to 30% of our capabilities are trapped somewhere in, you know, evolutionary parts of our brain um, that don't think we're capable of this. And unlocking that is something that all of those Olympians have done or were born with. Um, and we're all on a spectrum, but however you get there, whether it's a support system, like it was for Gabby in that show, whether it's therapy, whether it's, you know, finding some of those like freaky deaky mushrooms and taking those whatever <laughs> it is for you to get, get to that, boss, that, you know, boss mentality. It's, it's so important and not just so important from like a well-lived life perspective. Also so important from like a, you know, being able to get anywhere near your potential perspective. God, I feel empowered. I can't wait yeah. to turn my voice on and try to like tap into it. Oh, and it has to be, I mean, for me, like I, if anyone follows my stuff, like it's so full of humor, right? Like, and the reason it has to come back to that is like, as soon as I do these types of thoughts, I'm like, that is ridiculous. What are you even talking about? <laughs> that is, and I think about that all the time in running. It's like, wait, who cares? Why? What? Right. Uh, so for me, it almost becomes playing a character of like finding the the humor the play um and conscious constantly reinforcing that over and over and over and over again to where it kind of becomes who i am um even if it might not necessarily be my baseline setting um and i mean i think that in athletics like if you don't have that this the, the whole nature of sports the whole nature of being an athlete whether it's a runner a hiker you know a basketball player anything you're gonna have your hopes and dreams crushed over and over and over and over again and um just because you know we're relying on a uh slowly decaying body to do increasingly difficult things it's just not a great calculation for self-worth over time if you let it be um so that's where it comes in like you just need to harness that you need to like be giving yourself those those you know unicorn stickers that you got in elementary school and doing it not just once not just on your good days but on your bad days and on your worst days and uh, especially running up cable line, searching for mushrooms. Yeah, uh, uh, freaky deaky mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, you have a great way, David, of being able to zoom out. Um, I think that's that's one of your specialties that has really helped me sort of figure out what works, what doesn't work. Looking looking at the big picture, and not just from a hey, let's look at the month and let's look at the year, but literally, like let's look at who we are as evolutionary creatures on this planet in this system. Uh, in this universe, like you have a great way of being able to, to to zoom out. And I think that's crucially important in life 
like understanding why we're doing what we're doing uh, in regards to running and setting these goals, but realizing like we're stardust, you know, it's, that's a line from your book and, and talking about we're all made of the same thing ultimately in the whole scale of things. So all of this stuff, all of the positive self-talk sort of reflecting on how we're so strong and so capable of so many things, but sometimes that inner voice doesn't allow us to believe it, but yeah. to believe it and to, and, and the humor, you know, being able to yeah. do it with a, with a smile and with a positive if, outlook. If it requires achievement, you're already screwed. Like if it requires yeah. making some, reaching some goal, it's already over for you. It's just a question of when, yeah. um, you know, your best will never be enough unless it's always enough. And that becomes especially important in athletics that we're not doing these things. We're not doing those five tips or whatever else you know, you're doing or whatever race you're doing um, because of the achievements it leads, but because of the type of person you can then become through these, uh, you know, behaviors, the way it embodies things like what Han talked about with mindfulness and smile meditation, the fact that it brings you into the present in a way that like normal life doesn't, the way that like certainly scrolling on your phone wouldn't or something, which, you know, I spend way too much of my life doing. And that's why athletics can be so magical. It's like, oh, I'm in a, you know, decaying sack of bones. And not only is that not depressing, that is the most cool, uplifting, you know, thing that brings us all together and makes me feel love, not just for other people, but for myself. Um, but I think the hard part there is then you have to also just totally reckon with your impermanence and the lack of importance of a lot of this stuff. Um, so that's why, you know, I think athletics essentially is an excuse to play around with these, uh, these ideas. And the place that that starts, though, is not in a zoomed out perspective, reading Pieces Every Step or some other book. It's in the moment when you hate yourself being like, you know what? I'm actually OK. I'm fine. I like myself a little bit, or at least I can tolerate myself right now. And then turning that over time to, you know what? I am fucking amazing. And it is OK to say that. And that as soon as I uplift that in myself and like get validated in it, not only will I enjoy life a little more, I also get way faster because my brain's holding me back the because you know it's not like letting me show what i'm capable of because of these evolutionary processes that are specifically designed to pre prevent the types of activities you know we do and call it like a routine tuesday right uh big shout out to eric paramount and the for the mm. super chat we appreciate you eric and it has come to the point in the show where we have to turn over to kim to uh, get some of these live questions yeah, eric in his super chat dominating. says deborah and Sfara, cindy and matthew all have questions pending just trying to do a mini question intervention thank you for the super chat eric appreciate that eric. um just really quick before we get on to the questions uh i'm gonna write a letter to the seattle crack and see if they will hire david uh, to help uh, motivate and give unicorn stickers to all the players so they can believe Could in themselves it. some more and it. maybe you know, get a few more W's in our future. We're, right? we're on a tiny little streak right now. How do the Kraken not believe in themselves? When you're something like a Kraken, <laughs> actually, that's probably a great example. Even the Kraken have trouble with believing in themselves sometimes. You know, like uh, I, I'm, I'm actually, to be like direct, like I'm fortunate to have windows into the, background thought processes of some of the people that might be your sports idol or whatever, and they're struggling with it too, you know? Um, so I think that that's kind of what brings us all together in this. Just be the, be the happy uplifting Kraken. <laughs> <laughs> that uplifting Kraken. Mm -hmm. Let's get to some of those. All right. Questions. questions. Yeah. So there's a question from Cindy. It was earlier. Uh, they asked, I'm too, uh, 240 at six foot three and run about 35 miles per week. Should fat loss be the greatest focus for obese runners such as myself? I can increase mileage, but tend to get injured once approaching 50 miles per week. Yeah, I mean, I think the big thing with running comes back. You have to fuel the activity you're doing. If you don't, um, this the catabolic processes that can result can be really negative for your health. That doesn't mean that there's no time that like, you know, for reasons like perhaps type two diabetes or um, cholesterol or you know overall like well being and, and quality of life, it's not necessary to like slightly alter your body composition over time. But doing that in a healthy way requires you know either working with an expert or truly understanding your body's needs and uh, calibrating it in such a way that it's not just like eating yourself like in a negative manner, like in a way that's not healthy. So you know for that athlete, I would say. Every single body type is is different. 
and not knowing like what your general baseline is, that could be the healthiest place for you um, in the context of your athletic life and, and doing anything different might be extremely unhealthy and, and ill-advised. Um, so that's where I say, check out nutritionists um, because the, you know, the good ones are just life-changing, much in the way a running coach can be for your running. And they can also help you dial in, hey, maybe I'm just like kind of a badass 6'3", 240 runner. And you know, I'm not trying to look like the person that might be on the cover of a running magazine because they're a totally different you know, genetic context than I am. And where I am is enough as I am. So um, that's where I come back to talk to an expert to, to see exactly what is right for you. Because those people on the covers of running magazines, they're genetic like uh, anomalies in some sense, that that is kind of what their bodies, uh, you know, they fuel their bodies completely to be where they are, um, but that's where they end up. And, uh, you know, it's like a game of Plinko. All of our physiologies might wind up in different spots. There's no inherent value structure between, you know, one side versus the other side. Um, it's just kind of the way humans are made in such a, you know, beautifully diverse manner. Great. Uh, and then question from Matthew. And I feel like, I don't know, we we're already talking about cheer. That's like <laughs> coaching. <laughs> Uh, and just to clear it up, there was there was a little confusion in the chat room. Some folks thought we were talking about Cheers, oh, the, the show. show Cheers. <laughs> uh, we were talking about cheer. Yeah, cheer, <laughs> just not to, cheer. Just to clear that Singular, all up. Uh, question from Matthew. Matthew says, I'm start uh, starting coaching this year for a spring middle school track and then high school cross country in the fall. As someone who has never formally taught in, a, in an athletic sense, what would be your best advice? I love this. The heck yes, coaching. Heck yes, anyone out there that wants to get into coaching, but especially coaching kids. Um, the main thing for kids, if you can just get them to run easy and raise their aerobic volume a little bit while maintaining their top end output through things like strides, you are good to go from a training perspective. Um, at that age, the way talent unfolds is extremely individually unique, but usually all it needs is like a slight match lit under it. Um, and most of those kids, if you just can convince them that it's okay to go easy, um, and raise their volume slightly off of like the baseline, um, they're going to go through the roof as long as they also get, you know, maintain their top end speed. So, you know, basically you can keep the complex training elements pretty simple, especially in the base period. Um, but get them to run just a few more miles and a few more miles easily. Um, but most of all, just like constantly come back to like affirmation of them and where they're at always because so many people hate running for life because they conceive of it at a very young age or when they start as this thing that requires, you know, conditional uh, acceptance of themselves and it hurts and it just feels like punishment. If you can teach them that one, running doesn't hurt, two, you know, it's the type of thing that is just purely uplifting, um, then hopefully they'll be runners when they're 30 and 40 and pursuing their ultimate potential because, you know, they're, they haven't even scratched the surface yet. Nice. A uh, question from Deb runs far. Deb says, uh, David, with the start of this 2022 year and your athletes are posting their race goals, do you have to hold them back from doing too much training early on? Deb also uh, goes on to say, I'm super enthusiastic about my 2022 schedule and want to max all the training, but little nervous I'll blow up before the year really gets started. Yeah. Great question, Deb. That's a great question. You know, I think in general, I like to embrace that part of athletes. So I think there's a part of athletes that are doing it from maybe a negative headspace where they are not enough and they have to prove something. And as a result, will just like bury themselves into dust trying to chase that thing. Um, but if it manifests as motivation for 2022, then heck yes, just make sure that you're increasing it through, you know, easy volume and listening to your body and understanding your own limitations. Like as long as you're doing, turning the dials, dials a little bit slowly, keeping most of it easy, um, now is a great time to go all in on yourself. I'm all about that. Uh, you know, occasionally I need to have interventions, but usually that's not about like excitement for goals. Like that's usually about something deeper that it manifests itself in a similar way. If it's about like, hey, I just wanna see what I'm capable of and go for it, then freaking go for it. January 2022 is the perfect time. Um, and you know, I'm all about like, as soon as that, like fire is burning, I'll come in and throw some gas on it. As long as it's like, <laughs> you know, 
not super dry and windy where you are. <laughs> freaky. Uh, we can throw some freaky mushrooms in there too. And see what oh. happens. Hmm. Yeah. You know, I've actually never done any type of psychedelic, but I want to so bad. Uh, <laughs> There's no, nothing stopping you. Please do it on our you. show. Please <laughs> just do it on our show. We'll Anyone all do it. Probably like, oh, yeah, I, I see that. <laughs> we'll all sit down. We'll all do something. And uh, we'll just have a conversation <laughs> for 17 hours. This got weird. <laughs> I can't wait for that episode. <laughs> It'll be so good. 400. Episode 400. Um. I want to, uh, before we wrap up our main show here, I do want to go back over those uh, secret training tips, which are no longer secret because there's five of them. I, I Just as a reminder for our listeners and viewers, uh, we, let's go through them again. So obviously, first one was run five days a week, right? So I'm going to brush through this real quick. Yeah, go for that, it. That's just an excuse to, to talk to you guys. Um, so run five days a week. Uh, do one hill workout a week. That can also be flat and it just has to be 10 to 15 minutes of intervals uh eight hill strides a week uh one temp controlled tempo run of 20 to 30 minutes every two weeks and decide you own the downhills um so those are my tips but if i get to end with a parting note i want to touch on something that i really briefly touched on at the beginning but i think is really relevant to what we're talking about which is that okay all of this stuff about thinking you're amazing or whatever that's the end of the rain that's like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow it takes mm. time and it's not permanent, and you have to keep committing to it over and over and over again. But the initial stumbling point of all of that is how people cut themselves down verbally in the context of their lives, whether it's you know to themselves or to their friends or to their coworkers or anything else, and downplaying themselves and their own achievements and not just with running. So what I say is make 2022 the year where you never rely on self-depreciation in any part of your life. I think self-depreciation, in fact, the, the comedy special in the net on Netflix is amazing. And it had a much deeper dive into how this applies to like, you know, marginalized individuals. But I think for everyone, it's incredibly relevant that, you know, self-depreciation is often a defense mechanism that is either, you know, put onto us by society as a whole or something that we have developed to make it okay for us to you know, think less of ourselves or talk down to us or have this negative self-talk. So um, the first place I challenge everyone to start is to just stop with that. And if you do it, it's fine, but just recognize it and be like, hey, I'm going to stop that. But even if it's if for the, if I'm the butt of the joke, there's no good behind that for things that actually matter. You know, it can be about your eyebrows maybe, but don't make it about your running speed, about, you know, how well you public speak, about your sexual prowess, whatever it is that matters to you in your life, in those things, the first place to become a boss bitch is in not cutting yourself down and telling you, you know, saying that you're not. Um, so do that, do a little bit of that, like smile meditation where every time you come back to center, you're like, yeah, I am. I am pretty damn cool. And then I think like, you know, whether it's 2022 or a future year, so many amazing things are possible. Um, but you know, our brains are holding that extra 20 to 30%. And if we can just learn, you know, to find love in those dark spaces that, you know, fill up those 20 and 30%, then amazing lightness and amazing, um, you know, joy is ahead. I love it, man. And I love that we took it back to that because that's step one. Uh, I'm working on it every freaking day. Kim is my, like, my own personal coach that lives with me that <laughs> calls me out on any single time I do it. And I she's, do it a lot. She's your Maddie to your Gabby. Um telling you in the in the bathroom that you are the boss bitch. And you know you're the boss Weirdly bitch. Weirdly enough, that actually happens every day. <laughs> every like day. I'm, I'm in the mirror and Kim just goes in and she's just like, you're a bad bitch. And I'm like, oh I appreciate that. She's like, you're welcome. And then back And I say it in that voice also. Good morning. <laughs> That's my morning voice. Yeah, it's pre coffee. Yeah. She's pre -coffee. It's, her, it's her kraken voice. You gotta be yeah. the <laughs> When you're telling someone they're a bad bitch. <laughs> Tell me I'm a bad bitch now. You're a bad bitch. You're a bad bitch. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah. She, then she just hides in the cupboard. It's the coolest thing. <laughs> you're awesome. What a weird. What a you, who else you is on Freaky Mushrooms right now? Yeah. Anyone else? <laughs> you open the cupboard and you're like, release the Kraken. <laughs> Every morning. <laughs> Every morning. Uh, David Roach, you are a pleasure. You are a joy. And man... You need to write a second book. Heather yeah. in the chat also says that David needs to write a second book about his secret training tips. Uh, 
I also think you should write a second book. Um, you can call it secret training tips or whatever you want. Freaky mushroom tips. Yeah. Freaky <laughs> that's, mushroom. That's something else. <laughs> Everything I've heard from 17-hour podcast episode. I'm so glad that you just finally heard what I said. <laughs> well, oh, dear God. Now we're definitely flagged. flagged. Oh, yeah, we definitely got flagged. Um, David, we appreciate you. Can you uh, take a second and let people know where they can uh, find you as a coach, get your book, get your podcast, like uh, uh, let people know where they can find you, continue to follow you and find out more amazing training secrets and stuff every single day, every single week, because you're always delivering. Uh, so some work all play podcast is where Megan and I talk about random things, primarily shows uh, and stuff like that. Uh, so listen to that if you haven't subscribed. Uh, otherwise, just, you know, if you're listening to this and you're not a Patreon subscriber of Ginger Runner Live, just go on there, give them a couple bucks a month. It makes all the difference. And, you know, I get to see behind the scenes the difference Ethan and Kim make for people that they don't even know. And it's so massive and it's type exactly the type of thing we should affirm and if possible affirm with our pocketbooks. Uh, I really appreciate that, David, David. And we don't coach David to do that before the show. He does it every time <laughs> we have him on. And it's like, man, this is your time to tell people where to go to follow your stuff. And he's like, I'm not doing that. I'm telling where to go to support <laughs> you. And it's like, uh, it, we really appreciate it. That is it for today's Ginger Runner Live. We are going to move right into our after show with David. We're only going to keep him for a couple of minutes, and we have a couple of questions that we'll carry over to that after show. But if you would like to join our after show and ask any of those residual questions, get more one-on-one -on -one time with David or any of our guests week after week, as David mentioned, visit patreon.com slash the ginger runner. That's how you can support us, support the show, uh, and get awesome perks um, uh, on the back end, including our daily live stream. We'll be back tomorrow for Daily mm -hmm. Brew. Uh, it's our live stream that we do every single day, Monday through Friday, where we get to talk about a little bit of everything with some running sprinkled in. It's a lot of fun, and uh, you get to join the community as well. That is it. Am I forgetting anything? I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, uh, GR Crew member of the week will start up next week. Uh, so stay tuned for that. But thank you all so much for tuning in to tonight's episode 383 with David Roskin Roach, another Ask Coach Roach. We appreciate you all. Have a great rest of your night. We'll see you next week. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Ginger Runner.